Welcome, everyone. I'm Megan Dugan Adele from New America Chicago, and I'm really pleased that you could join us today. Uh, we'll be sharing the results of a new report that provides new insights into how all of us together can help our city recover following the pandemic. Um, and they are certainly generalizable to you know, some other parts of the country as well. If you're joining us from somewhere else. Um, masks and mandates are ending and we're all really tired of hearing about COVID-19, I know. Uh, but for those of us who are focused on the future of our city and our country, we really don't have the luxury of ignoring the long-term impact that this pandemic has had um, in particular on Black and Latinx communities. Recovering economically reco requires that people have recovered enough to work at full capacity. Um, and that really takes concerted support from community leaders and politicians and really everyone in our community together. To help guide um, our work with the trust and we rise together to push for equitable recovery policy, New America Chicago commissioned this report from DECOME to really listen to how the pandemic has affected several key Black and Latinx areas of the city, as well as to learn more directly from community members about what their communities and families need, not to just recover, but to thrive. So for the next 50 minutes, um, 55 minutes, we'll share more about the We Rise Together initiative, which is one of the most exciting recovery initiatives that I've ever encountered. Um, we'll also learn about the findings and community priorities for recovery from our research partner, Become. We'll share how this information will be used going forward, as well as share some analysis from the trust policy team about how recovery dollars have been spent and where there are still opportunities for equitable recovery investment. Uh, finally, we'll, we'll wrap with an open question and answer discussion session. So I'll turn it over now to my esteemed colleague, Gloria Castillo, who will share more about We Rise Together. Oh, the best part of the pandemic will come when we never say you're on mute again. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Megan. And thanks to all of you for joining us today. A very special thanks to those of you who helped promote or participated in the seven community conversations that provided the, the basis for this report. The voice of community is invaluable to our work. We Rise Together and the Chicago Community Trust were pleased to collaborate with New America Chicago to commission BECOME to facilitate community conversations in the fall of 2021. We Rise Together is an accelerator towards equitable economic recovery to help ensure that the region and everyone who lives here is on track to reach its full potential. We understand that for the economy to recover, people must recover. And that's why everything we do is grounded in community. Our approach, and we'll pull up a slide just to make it a little bit easy for you to, to kind of visualize the We Rise approach. Our approach is to bring together philanthropy, business, community, nonprofit, and local government. And what you'll see is squarely in the center, is authentic community engagement. We leverage three intervention tools to advance change. Philanthropic investments, business practices, and public practices and policies. Community conversations are one way community voices are helping to shape our strategy, but it's really only one way. We'll continue to facilitate community conversations as part of our ongoing evaluation of how we're doing. Your voice is also um, represented in our working groups alongside of business, development, finance, and philanthropy. I just think it's really important um, that people read the report. It's very rich. And as we, as we move on, my colleagues are gonna go into detail and you'll learn so much more about this work. Thank you. Thank you, Gloria. Um, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, so my name is uh, Gabriela Garcia, and with me is also my colleague, Lisa Sargent. Uh, we're both community advocate and co-creators uh, for a nonprofit organization that is located in Chicago called Become, as uh, has already been mentioned. Um, and just really quickly, Become is a movement building organization that facilitates authentic community uh, leadership and co-creates strategies and solutions to help communities actualize their collective liberation. 
And next slide. And so our work is grounded in uh, cult what we call culturally responsive practices, where um, we partner with the people with the community of focus and we uh, are aware and responsive to the surrounding context and culture of the of the projects that we work on and so in a nutshell that is how we approached uh, this research it's much more of course nuance um, and much more details in terms of the, the culture responsive practices framework that grounds our work um, and so the the goal of this research which actually began about a year ago um, or at least the partnership with become um, Begin about a year ago in March of 2021, um, the goal was to provide an in-depth, uh, nuanced understanding of how people living in Chicago neighborhoods that have been hardest hit by the pandemic, how they were affected by the pandemic, and in particular, um, in what ways were they affected financially. And so in partnership with the Trust and New America, we worked on recruitment and outreach for the community conversations. And then between September and November of 2021, we virtually facilitated community conversations in the seven neighborhood areas that you see in this slide here. Um, next slide. And to help further frame who participated in these conversations, out of the 56 participants, close to half identified as African American Black, and about a third identified as Latinx or Hispanic. Um, also close to half of the participants identified as cisgendered women. And in terms of the household income, um, there was more of a variety there with the highest percentage uh, being 24%, and that representing participants who reported having an income between 50,000 and 74,000. Uh, next slide. Um, and so now I want to briefly talk through the six key findings that we learned from the community members, along with just echoing what Gloria said, um, uh, want to say or we want to say thank you again to all the organizations who supported with recruitment, who hopefully some are on this event listening in, and as well thank you to the residents uh, who participated in the conversations, um, who I also hope are here and, and, and learn and, and receive the report and read through it and um, just want to acknowledge just how much those conversations were, were filled with a lot of emotion, pain, loss, but also a lot of hope and resilience. So just want to acknowledge that. Um, next slide. Um, so living through the COVID-19 pandemic profoundly impacted um, or affected the emotional and well-being, uh, mental well-being of participants. Um, and this was something that was heard loud and clear across all of the community conversations. Uh, participants talked about feeling a range of negative emotions from fear, anxiety, desperation, and pure sadness, which were tied to living through things like physical isolation, um, balancing working from home while at the same time taking care of family, taking care of children, uh, helping their children virtually learn. Um, it, would, it was also tied to not knowing what was going to happen next with the pandemic. Um, and so here on this slide is one of the many powerful quotes from participants that we hope captures some of the distress that we heard um, that was being experienced. And so I'll go ahead and read it. Quote, having to experience both seeing what's happening to people around you, people losing their life, in retrospect was the hardest issue. It was a period of uncertainty. I never knew what was going to happen to the people I knew. Just being tied up and staying in the house all day was just miserable for me." End quote. And so this finding highlights that in order to holistically recover from the pandemic, the mental and emotional well-being of Chicago residents needs to be prioritized. And I know that's something that Gloria also um, um, mentioned as well. Next slide. The second insight um, elevates how the pandemic rocked the financial stability of participants. And so some of the stress and anxiety that participants talked about experiencing or even hearing about from loved ones or neighbors was also due to changes in employment. So things like temporary or permanent job loss, uh, reduction in work hours or having their salaries cut. Um, participants also talked about doing what they could to make ends meet. So that meant for some depleting their savings, taking out high interest bank loans, asking family members for money or working multiple and or low paying jobs. Um, but it wasn't enough for, 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 for participants um, it, as illustrated by this quote here, uh, quote, I experienced a hike in my water bill as well as my electricity tariff. 
considering the fact that I don't get even more from my job because I don't work more as I used to before the pandemic, it's quite difficult meeting up with these bills when the wages are not sufficient, end quote. And so this finding really emphasizes the nuances of employment during the pandemic in the sense that even as some were employed and they were working, it still wasn't enough to survive and make ends meet. Um, next slide. So building on the second insight, this third insight really emphasizes how the pandemic greatly impacted the ability of participants to meet basic needs. So like having food to eat or a place to live in. Um, participants shared how they consistently worried about feeding their family or hearing about neighbors just going without meals and experiencing malnutrition. And all of this being exacerbated by the lack of local grocery stores or limited access to quality food in the neighborhood. Um, but participants also acknowledged that um, how local organizations and churches were working hard to meet the need for food. And so here's a quote from an Austin resident who talked about working towards putting up fridges in their neighborhoods um, and that through these efforts, quote, we've been able to help a lot of people. I remember seeing people with their bags ready while I'm stocking the fridge so they can get some food for themselves and their family. We launched more than a year ago and the demand is still there. We have 20 something fridges now. So, and um, close, end quote, there you go. Um, and so um, in terms of the housing security, uh, what we heard from participants uh, was more around what they've seen with their neighborhood or um, in their neighborhood. Uh, so seeing people having to move in with family, um, seeing people or neighbors that they know having go from house to house trying to find shelter, or some neighbors having to move out of the city just because it just wasn't affordable to, to live in the city. Uh, next slide. Um, and so when we asked, what in your neighborhood has been the most impacted by the pandemic? Participants talked about first how local businesses, especially small owned businesses, were the were one of the most impacted areas in their neighborhoods. Um, second, participants also talked about how social life had changed due to the things like the restrictions, the stay at home order, uh, the fear of getting COVID and businesses closing. And so as echoed in this quote here on this slide, in my neighborhood, life has changed from the social standpoint because quite a quite a number of social activities that have been going on prior to the COVID-19 period has stopped. The crowd and the population we used to have in the malls have reduced, in the cinemas have reduced, even in churches. Um, and so as COVID changed, changed and impacted the sense of community and sense of safety for some participants. Um, participants also noted seeing an increase in local crime. So things like carjackings, drug activity, gun violence. Next slide. The fifth insight draws attention to how being undocumented, being an undo undocumented immigrant in the US intensifies the impact of the pandemic. And so it's important to remember that undocumented individuals live in constant fear of being deported or detained. And as a result, um, there's often a lot of fear or hesitancy with speaking up. And so this fear was really intensified during the pandemic. And so participants who live in Cicero and um, in Cicero or South, South Lawndale, which both have a large population of undocumented immigrants, shared how um, more and more employers are asking for citizenship status. So that's impacting employment opportunities for undocumented uh, people. Um, they also shared how undocumented individuals didn't receive a stimulus or weren't able to apply for other resources. Um, and then um, they also talked about how undocumented people are having to come to terms with, the, with what this community member said on this on the slide, quote, I know that we when you don't have a piece of paper to back you up for a job, you get paid less. But there are times when I tell the person it's this or nothing. Yes, they are getting paid less, but at least it's a job. So while this finding only came up or this insight came up only within two of the neighborhood conversations, um, it's still crucial to attend to and in, in, in thinking about what does it mean to develop an equitable recovery from the pandemic for the city of Chicago. Um, next slide. And last, but certainly not least, um, amidst all the hardship, participants 
acknowledge some silver linings from living through the pandemic. And this was something that was very prominent from the beginning of the conversations and throughout the conversations. Uh, participants were able on their own to put things in perspective. And so as exemplified by this quote here, quote, I also believe that this pandemic has taught us to value each day. Every morning is a new opportunity because we don't know. Now we are living on the strength of a string with this pandemic, end quote. Um, and so it's important to continue to build on that strong commitment for survival and unity as shown by all of the participants here. Um, and so with that, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Lisa Sargent, who's gonna talk through uh, the recommendations that came from the community conver uh, conversation participants. Thanks, Gabby. So we really wanna highlight and honor that these recommendations, next slide, please that these recommendations did not come from us, they came directly from community residents. So this first set of suggestions here center on what individuals expressed they and their loved ones would need to significantly recover. Um, one of the recommendations is for the city to work with businesses to provide employment opportunities for folks who either lost their jobs or had their work hours reduced. There is also a desire to help individuals successfully digitize their jobs which would essentially help them shift their professional careers and skill sets into the digital space. This could look like helping folks incorporate technology into their business operations or hosting trainings on um, setting up websites or other platforms so they can still work and thrive when um, in-person is not a viable option. The second recommendation was providing financial support for folks at risk of losing their jobs. An example that folks provided um, was that the city could do a great deal in supporting individuals' basic needs by mapping neighborhoods where low-income folks are at greater risk of homelessness and providing them with emergency rental assistance. Financial counseling and guidance was also mentioned, specifically trainings on budgeting, saving, and investing. The fourth recommendation spoke to receiving financial assistance for fees associated with transportation for those who are um, required to go to work in person, as well as financial assistance for grocery delivery services for those who now work at home. The last recommendation here is a call for the city to increase awareness of resources that are already available for individuals and their families to tap into. And some examples that were given um, include child care for parents returning to work and youth-centered resources like apprenticeships and scholarships. Next slide, please. So moving to recommendations for local businesses and organizations, this set of suggestions focuses on what participants, um, a few of whom were also business owners, see as potential solutions to help their neighborhoods recover. So these recommendations here are pretty straightforward, but they include tax breaks provided by the city, which was a huge recommendation that came up across our conversations. Another recommendation was offering free advisory services that are designed to really help business owners and staff talk through and solve some, some challenges that they're facing in real time. A third recommendation voiced um, was providing grants and incentives that promote entrepreneurship, especially for new business owners. The next recommendation was around providing staffing support to meet the various needs of the community to ensure a follow-up is done as they continue to service their communities through the pandemic. And a really important um, last recommendation here we heard was the need to invest in and build infrastructure for local businesses, uh, local businesses to collectively uh, support and problem solve together. Um, now I'll pass it on to Kristen Wiggins to discuss how the We Rise initiative will use these insights and recommendations to build a sustainable movement forward. Thanks so much, Lisa. I really appreciate this. We can go to the next slide if uh, possible, please. Um, as you can see, uh, and we'll take, I'll take one more uh, progression in the slide if possible. Thanks so much. Um, I wanted to share how um, we had the opportunity to receive these recommendations back in um, the late fall, as soon as these conversations were finished and got to see um, really and read how um, how the pandemic had affected our communities and was creating an ongoing impact for our communities. So I'm just going to revisit, as Gloria mentioned earlier today, 
we have three different levers of change. We have philanthropy, we have uh, our inclusive business practices and public policy. Um, and through philanthropy, we do grant making in three different areas. We do grant making to spur um, development in um, underinvested neighborhoods through what we call neighborhood anchor projects. We're strengthening small, small businesses and businesses of color in communities that were hard hit by COVID. And we're working to increase quality, resilient employment in those same communities. Um, I'll go to the next slide. So I just wanted to share some examples of how we really read the conversations that were provided to us by Become and the report provided us to us by Become and really dug in to think about what should the implications be for our grant making? What should we do to make sure that we're really honoring those insights from our community? So I'm going to give you three different examples of some projects that we funded that I think really demonstrate how we listened. Um, the first is around our neighborhood investment grants. Um, these we've uh, to date we've made 14.3 million dollars uh, in investments in 17 different projects that are spread through 13 different Chicago communities and one um, suburban Cook County location. Um, these are all places that had really high COVID impact, but had also been experiencing historic disinvestment for years. They're going to leverage a total of $191 million worth of investment in these same communities. And one of those examples is Esperanza Health and Vita Pediatrics in West Lawn. So this project came to us, it's a, it's a health center that is trying to expand on an existing pediatric clinic. And one of the important ways that they wanted to expand was to make sure they were providing mental health opportunities for both kids and adults, but in the setting where you would get all of your other health care. So that meant the, the stigma around receiving mental health can be diminished because you're at a regular clinic with, with regular doctors and we're not differentiating between your physical health and your mental health. And this was the real concept behind the build out of this project. We felt like it really honored what we heard, which is that people need to recover emotionally, mentally, and physically in order for the economy to recover. So we were excited to see this project come across our radar just as we had read these conversations and were able to really think about how um, this honored that, that intention of the community conversations. Um, we can go to the next slide if you would please. We've also done grant making around um, inclusive workforce and thinking about how to really make a resilient long-term workforce um, that will really build, build our economy on, in the long run, but also help people in the short run. Um, but having just read the conversations when we were putting together our request for proposal, one of the things we wanted to ask uh, these different organizations that were applying is, how are you supporting the whole needs of folks who are re-entering re the workforce? How are you really thinking about them as whole people? Um, and Revolution Workshop, one of, our, one of the grantees in that round, really epitomized what it looked like to, su to supply wraparound services in a way that was, were thoughtful. This is an organization that really helps people enter the construction trades, um, but they really think about how to support folks who need flexible scheduling because maybe they have childcare issues or drop-off issues. They provide um, financial literacy training so that people know what to do and how to use their money in a smart way. They also offer really easy on-ramps and off-ramps to their programs, recognizing that people will have bumps in the road as they get back into the workforce. And so people can come and go and enter and exit the program as they need to. Um, they provide coaching and mental health support services for everyone. And they do this on an ongoing basis, not just during the project, but for the whole first year of a person's sort of graduation. And we, again, we felt like this really honored that, that learning that came out of these community conversations that it's gonna take more than one thing and more than one kind of support to really help people get back um, into the uh, full of the economy um, in a way that they can support their families in an ongoing basis. And I'll take the last slide here. We wanna give what, a one third example. Um, I wanna highlight what Gabby said about what we heard really around the, the sense that there is something lost in community and that sense of community where people just weren't out anymore and businesses were closing and people weren't walking around and it just, change the sense of, the, of, of how their community came together. And we wanted to think about some of those recommendations around supporting small businesses and local small businesses. Um, and one of the projects we supported in the second round of neighborhood anchor grants is called Ogden Commons in North Lawndale. And Ogden Commons is, um, 
is a building that has health healthcare services on the second and third floor. But the first floor is filled intentionally with retail to support community um, and community amenities and to really create some foot traffic and a sense of uh, vitality um, around that, that street in um, North Lawndale and Ogden Avenue. So on the first floor of this building, there's a new bank branch, there's a coffee shop, and there is a new um, locally owned restaurant called Jow Grill. Um, and so this is the kind of opportunity we think will start to bring people out back into the community, walking around, um, doing things that make the community feel both more vibrant, but also just safer because there are more eyes on the street and more activity on the street. Um, so these are just three examples we wanted to share back with everyone about how we really used the information that we heard and we will continue to use the information that we're hearing to make grants that really um, meet the needs of our community residents and community leaders. That's awesome, Kristen. I, um, one of the things I love about what you were talking about, this, I, one thing I'd like people to know is that this work is a continuation of work that we did at the beginning of We Rise Together, where we released a port, report called Thriving After the Pandemic that's on the New America website. And we talked to leaders around um, the city, particularly in Black and Latinx communities, um, and people said, like, we want a vibrant community, like, we want to live somewhere where we can walk places, where we don't have to go miles and miles to get to entertainment and a grocery store and, you know, just the basics of having a vibrant full life. So I, I love that you guys are thinking about this. Thanks. Um, no problem. Thank you. Um, with that, I will turn it over to Yana Kachuris from the Trust, the Chicago Community Trust. Great, thank you, Megan. Um, I'm Yana Kachuris. I lead the policy and advocacy work at the Trust and do a lot of work related to um, relief and recovery in partnership with the We Rise Together team. So really happy to be part of this conversation. And we wanted to talk a little bit about the potential that the federal dollars that are coming into the region um, present um, in actually meeting and addressing the needs that have been lifted up in the, the conversa community conversations and, and highlighted by um, Gabby and, and Lisa um, leading up to this portion of the conversation. So um, if we go to the next slide, wanted to present a little bit of a picture for folks about um, the federal funding that's coming into the region that can be used towards an equitable and inclusive recovery. Um, and this slide is um, has not yet been released, but it's part of some data and analysis that the Urban Institute is doing for us and um, through a partnership that we have with them that's looking at mapping where those federal dollars are going and how those federal dollars can be used. Um, and just wanted to share this because we, we hear a lot about the federal dollars that are coming in and there's a lot of money. Um, Chicago um, was allocated almost $2 billion um, from the American Rescue Plan Act, which is just one piece of what's presented here in those glass bars. And the county received about $1 billion um, in, the, in uh, state and local fiscal relief. And so these dollars actually pre provide some more, more flexibility than um, traditional federal funding flows. Um, and so there's an opportunity to really think more creatively about how to use those dollars. Um, and, but there's, I wanna note that there's also almost another $1 billion coming to Chicago and about another 700 million coming to Cook County for things like transportation, housing, infrastructure, workforce development, et cetera, that, that don't come with that flexibility, but there are opportunities that it presents um, to really kind of leverage. And to that end, if we go to the next slide, the trust um, and we rise together and, and through partnerships that we have um, with grantees uh, like New America, we're really thinking about how do we leverage this once in a generation investment for more long-term transformative change and that responds to the needs that communities have identified. Um, and we are really focusing our efforts at the trust thinking about how can we support the coordination across all levels of government. Part of the challenge that that federal funding flows present is that they're coming from myriad sources, multiple layers of government, um, different funding programs, and to achieve maximum impact and to make sure that we're responding to community needs, there needs to be a level of coordination there. So how can we support that through our grant making, through advocacy, et cetera. And then using our voice in the platform that we have at the trust to really make sure that the communities that have been disinvested for generations and that have been particularly hard hit in the pandemic 
that those investments go to those communities and to those people, those businesses, and those who are hardest hit by the pandemic and who have been most likely to be left behind in prior recoveries. And um, certainly this recovery is different or this, this recession is different than others, but how do we make sure that um, Black and Latinx communities in particular are not um, left behind in the recovery. And so we ourselves engage, are engaging in some advocacy, but to be able to do that, we really wanna understand how the city, the county, the state and the federal government are distributing those resources. So if we go to the next slide, we spent a little bit of time mapping where those American Rescue Plan Act dollars are going, mapping to the insights that were lifted up by Lisa and Gabby in the report and we've kind of bucketed them in a few areas one around employment opportunities. And we see that the city and the county and the state has already been doing some of the resource allocation, but how those dollars get distributed, where we really wanna understand where those, where we can help influence the conversation around um, how those dollars are administered because policy advocacy isn't just about passing legislation and a budget, it's also about how those dollars um, are implemented. Um, there's. Uh, you can read what's what's on the slide, but really thinking about support for local businesses and the city has spent some time thinking about start shuttered and entertainment venues and we know those entertainment venues are critical for vibrant um, communities. Um, and how do we make sure that um, those businesses and those struggling in the pandemic and to get get off the ground again in the recovery have the resources, the grants um, that are needed. Um, and then finally, we spent some time also uh, advocating for the direct cash assistance programs that both the city and the county are now have now announced and are thinking about. Um, we sit on the advisory board with the city, um, along with several other folks to help advise how to design that cash assistance program and invest in evaluation efforts that will help us understand what we can learn from that pilot and apply those lessons to other public assistance programs to reduce barriers and make sure that more people have what they need to be successful um, in life. And so I will pause there and hand it over to Megan. That's great, thank you, Yana. Um, and I just wanna flag for people, these three buckets that Yana has on the slide, employment opportunity support for local businesses, um, and support for basic needs are um, kind of the buckets of policy recommendations that are in the report. So um, those came directly from community and those were kind of the, um, in summarizing what came from those community conversations, those were the three top buckets that people raised in the community conversations. Um, I will um, briefly, um, some of you are not very familiar with New America Chicago um, and the work that New America is doing in Chicago. So I wanna talk a little bit about that, why we're here, what, what our role is in this. Um, but then I wanna talk a little bit about what's next. So what are our opportunities for um, doing um, continue, continued advocacy in this space? Um, so um, at, the, at the beginning of the pandemic or early on in the pandemic, the trust asked us to help um, um, them as they developed We Rise Together. And, it's just been an incredible opportunity to really think really strategically and prioritize how recovery happens to make sure that it's equitable. And um, a big part of our role in the early planning for We Rise Together um, was really continuing to elevate, um, which really started in 2020, um, continuing to elevate community voice and sharing what's happening in different communities so that we're not just um, guessing based on what we see, but we're taking a more holistic view um, and listening to multiple communities that may or may not um, have a voice um, in, our, um, in our political processes and in our city. Um, so this work really listening to communities and advocating for public change um, uh, that works for people um, is really at the heart of what New America Chicago does. And it's really at the heart of our work with the policy team, with Yana's team at the Trust and with We Rise Together. Um, so those of you for, who aren't familiar with us, just really quickly, New America is a think and do tank. Um, we do extensive work in civic cohesion, democracy, education, global studies. Um, and the New America Chicago works in two of our other verticals, which are in the technology and the public interest and our family and economic security work. Um, and we're really working closely with local community on issues of economic equity and particularly from a racial equity standpoint. So we do um, original research that really explores innovative policy ideas and we're um, really trying to make sure that um, our public policy and our public programs that are meant to support communities are really grounded in community voice. They're really grounded in the lived experience of residents. And we usually use a public interest kind of tech approach um, on, on some of those projects. Um, one of the reasons um, 
that we worked on this is because a driving force behind our work is really creating better feedback loops between local communities and policymakers. I think all of us have seen ways that um, sometimes government programs and policies just don't work well when they come against the reality, reality of people's lives. Um, so we're bringing something called the new practice, um, which is modeled after user experience research and tech and design in the tech and design world to public policy. Um, so we've done a number of sprints to help uncover pain points and solutions to um, improve access to different programs um, like foster care in Rhode Island and fixing you know, racial inequity that's baked into unemployment insurance. Um, this partnership with We Rise, The Trust, and Become represents one of the first projects in our new community policy team. Um, and that joins work that we've done um, on trying to eradicate um, predatory lending in, the Illinois, in Illinois and Chicago, um, as well as trying to improve access to um, tax credits. Um, so our goal is really to change the way that laws and government programs are designed in Springfield and Washington by starting with communities. Um, we're trying to build a totally new policy design and delivery approach that's really grounded in the wealth of experience that's already in our communities to make sure that government works better for people. Um, public policy works, but only if it gets to people. And so we find ways to open the gate or create other ways to access that support um, for people. So what's next? Um, the research with Become really allows us to a peek into how recovery dollars are actually reaching communities because we did this research in the fall. Um, there were, you know, there's quite a bit of research or recovery dollars that had already come out. Um, and we really heard that, you know, the stimulus checks and other supports um, like the renter, the moratorium um, on evictions and those kind of things did make a difference for people, but there's still need. And I think it can be really easy for those of us who are in white collar jobs um, to, um, you know, we still have our jobs and maybe we saved money during the pandemic, but for people who had to work out in the community, um, you know, some of them were too scared to go to work because they're afraid of getting sick. You know, others um, maybe were out of work if they were in the entertainment industry or in transportation. They might have been out of work for 10 months. And that is very hard to come back from when you have, um, when you're not earning a lot of money in the first place and you don't have a lot of resources. Um, so um, next slide. So I just wanna, before we switch over to question and answer, I just wanna flag for people uh, some of the key areas identified in the community conversations that residents and community members said, listen, these are the things that we, that people in our community still need to recover, that we, you know, there's still a lot of challenges. So people still were looking for financial assistance and emergency funds. Um, people were still struggling, you know, um, as people know, a lot of mothers have left the workforce. People don't have a place to take their children. That's just, you know, it, they can't go back to work. Um, that people still needed help with rental assistance, that there were more homeless, you know, people who were really struggling with homelessness or were on the, uh, on the verge of that. And that the increased costs from, um, uh, from inflation um, was making it really hard for people to pay basic costs. And they're already behind. They've already spent up their savings. They've already run up their um, credit. And so people don't have as much of a cushion. Um, people also talked a lot about mental health support and how, as um, Gabby talked about, and I won't um, belabor that, but just reminding people that people can't get back to normal and work at their best selves if they don't have help with that as well. And we've all faced a lot and there's been a lot of trauma people faced. Um, and then um, I won't go into detail on all these. They're, these are all in the um, report and also in our executive summary but um, that we really need to think about how do we support undocumented individuals in our community that have, that are, have really been hit extremely hard. Um, and then um, people are more open than ever to new technology and they're using technology to do things in new ways. And so people were asking for help to be able to really capitalize that on that to start new businesses, find work in new ways um, and really change the way that work happens. So, I think these are all really exciting things that as a community, and I think I'm specifically thinking of policy advocates and people who work in the policy space, these are things that we can be advocating for um, to um, uh, really see change in our community and support these communities. So over the next few months, we'll be working with We Rise and the Trust to make sure the findings from these community conversations get to the people who can make the decisions. So for example, right now, um, there are recovery dollars um, that haven't been allocated at the state level. Those budget negotiations are happening. 
um, now. So we're working with the trust to get those lessons learned and policy recommendations out to state legislators and agency heads to make sure that this can inform how they allocate those dollars. You can help with that by talking to your legislators. Um, over the next year, we'll also be building out the infrastructure for our community policy work and we're looking for partners. So please let us know if you're interested. Um, and with that, I wanna turn it over to Gloria for our question and answer. Thank you so much, Megan, and thank you for your leadership. Um, your, your work at New America is, is incredibly impactful, and we depend on you for your very honest and forthright voice. Um, it's so necessary to have someone who will always be ready to speak uh, truth to power. Um, so we did have a question in the, in the chat about tax breaks. And, and while we didn't hear specifically from community about, you know, kind of into the nitty gritty of the tax breaks, I am interested in just, Yana, if you could help us think a little bit about how, how do, when we hear from community about what they need, what does that look like when we make policy recommendations? Hmm. Take us behind the scenes a little bit, because most of us don't know how that how that might play out. So that's a good question, and I, I don't think it's something that we do particularly well. Um, but when we have an opportunity, like for example, with um, the cash pilot, I really want to applaud the city in the way that they've approached that, in that they've invited community members, experts into a conversation about how best to design it. So saying, so taking the the conversation around, okay, we're gonna give $500 a month to households to meet their basic needs and how are we gonna do that? Well, when that really comes down to it, it is, you know, the cash is one thing, but how do we also make sure that they have access to other supports and other um, access, let's say the information around eviction prevention and things like that. So making sure that that perspective is considered as we are de designing who is able to participate in a pilot like that recognizing that undocumented folks in particular are not able to avail themselves of things like the economic impact payments that came very early in the pandemic, the, the cash um, that came from the federal government or the child tax credit assistance. Those kinds of programs are not available to undocumented folks. So making sure that where those dollars can be flexible, making sure that undocumented folks are part of that pilot eligibility. So setting those tables, making sure that you're hearing from folks in the community as you're developing or considering legislation. There are lots of pieces of legislation that are out there right now in Springfield thinking about how do we meet um, folks need. Child care is another one. There are a couple of proposals out there right now to expand child care tax, the child tax credit at the state level um, as the federal expansion has lapsed and making sure that um, as that legislation is written, um, that it, it considers who the, the eligibility and the way that families need that cash assistance or that, that child tax credit to hit their bank account when those, um, when those uh, childcare bills come in. And so really looking at that legislation. And so Megan made it, mentioned another, how to make sure that your legislators are hearing from you. Um, and really thinking about it. So there's, there's, there's multiple ways that we can make sure that community voice is in the conversation. Thank you. And I think one important thing is that we all need to realize that at this inflection point in the recovery, we're all learning. We're working as quickly as we can, um, but we all continue to learn. Um, and I think it was interesting, Megan, that you looked at a number of currently critical needs and we rise is really designed to look at um, how how will we be resilient when the next economic crisis hits? We know that the economy is cyclical. We will come out of this crisis, we'll get strong, and then another crisis will hit. But what we've seen over decades is that the same communities get hard hit hard over and over again. So we are really thinking about. Yeah, fortunately, the, the trust has um, the capacity to, along with many other uh, funders, to look at current critical needs. And We Rise is trying to think about how do we become more resilient in our communities over the long run. Kristen, you mentioned that um, community voice 
was important as you selected the projects or as we as a, as a group in our grant review team selected projects. But could you talk a little bit about how you thought about constructing the, the request for proposal? I mean, really from the beginning of the stage to, to ensure that what we heard um, was reflected in the proposals we received. Yeah, I, that was really an intentional component after we had a chance to read the community conversations. And I really did sit down and think, all right, what is community saying that they need? And so how do we elicit that response from um, the nonprofit community that will be applying for this? So um, I think I mentioned, you know, one of the questions are, how are you planning to holistically support um, applicants for jobs or people reentering the workforce? We actually did ask questions like, um, are, are your funds available for folks who are undocumented? And if not, what's the plan to try to make sure that those folks can also use your services? Um, we liked some of the things we looked for in responses were these connections to other basic needs providers. So recognizing that not everyone who does workforce training can also do, be a basic needs provider, but they can help create those links between the folks that are coming in through their doors and the folks that need the, that support for basic needs. So we did ask questions to try to tease out where those connections to other um, social service providers in the ecosystem were also. Um, the other thing is I just wanna highlight that this is not a one and done kind of thing where we listened one time and we're gonna just keep using that same information going forward. We've really designed We Rise Together to make sure that we have places where we hear back from community in multiple different ways at multiple different intervals, whether or not it's through our working groups that are built around some of our um, grants, whether or not it's our upcoming partnership with MAPCOR to, to have the youth go out into communities and ask questions on an ongoing basis. There is, there is continued work that we're going to be doing so that as we develop more RFPs, we're building um, and listening and listening for changes, right? Listening for how the um, economy is changing, how the recovery is changing, um, Gloria and I sat here about a year ago. We kind of thought we would be at a different place six months after that. And so, you know, we've, we've maybe stopped trying to just predict where we're going to be and instead build a really good system for listening to community and being nimble to be, re to be responsive to what we hear. Thank you, Kristen. And speaking of listening to community, Dr. Garcia and Lisa, you are critical in, this, in Chicago in helping many organizations listen to community. Can you tell us a little bit about what you're seeing across the city? How are people really, you know, particularly in the wake of, of George Floyd's murder, I think people determined that it was more important than ever that we are intentional about listening to community about where their pain points are and also where their hope is. What are you seeing that maybe you didn't see a year ago? And I'll, I'll start with Lisa and then come to Dr. Garcia. Are you able to unmute Lisa? Not quite yet. All right, how, would it, how about if we switch that up and we go with Dr. Garcia first and then Lisa, you, you'll have time to get come off of mute. Yeah, um, so Gloria, your question was in terms of what are we seeing now with community engagement versus um, what we weren't seeing before. Um, I think I can I can also speak in relation to our evaluation and research work where we're seeing that community engagement be such an important and critical component to to the work that we do right and um being more mindful and i think something that there was a lot of learning with something that we, we did it's in the report but we didn't mention during the presentation is being really intentional about uh hosting community conversations in spanish right and then having those resources in order to be able to do that from the beginning from the re recruitment from the development of the protocol all the way to facilitating the conversation to having it translated um, transcribed i mean and then um uh, working through how are we going to disseminate this both in english and spanish right so i think that's definitely um i think something that we're becoming much more mindful of the importance of those um uh, uh paying attention to the different uh languages and um 
I think, um, I mean, the, the other thing that comes to mind that uh, was also the, the um, uh, facilitating these conversations in, in virtually, right, and what that meant in terms of engagement and thinking of, you know, who, uh, who we didn't hear from versus who we did hear from and how that would be different if we were able to do those in person or not in person. Um, but I'm, we're definitely, I think, seeing a much more um, um, intentional awareness of the power of community and that communities have the solutions to the challenges that they face, right? And so we're seeing um, a lot more of those organizations being attentive to that and prioritizing that within research, strategic planning, evaluation. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know if Lisa, if you want to add anything else to that? I would also say um, being flexible in our outreach and engagement strategies. So knowing that even though most, well, initially these conversations were supposed to take place in person, really doing that shift, making that shift, um, thinking about should it be hybrid, should it be virtual, and thinking about safety, choosing these to be virtual. Um, when it came to the outreach, there were a lot of folks that did not have email or there were older folks, um, participants that were using family members' emails. So really making sure that we're trying to touch point, um, whether it was like flyers in the community or it was me texting folks um, and making those calls instead. Um, we just really were flexible in terms of how we were engaging with folks um, in the digital space where there's already a divide. Thank you. We do have a question in the chat that I'm not, you know, I'm not sure exactly who's going to have the right. Um, set of expertise to to respond to this, but it's it's really about how do we connect workforce um, and and housing so that those who are living in particular communities have new opportunities. And so I'll I'll ask if anybody wants to speak to that specifically, but then I'll turn to to Kristen to talk a little bit about how we're layering our neighborhood anchor investments our workforce investments along with our small business to, to um, help to transform communities. So I'll just start with, um, does anyone have a real clear picture of a table where workforce and housing are, are working together? If not, we'll try to find that information. I mean, the Chicago Jobs Council has a lot of different working groups. And I think that sometimes there are housing providers that are kind of doing dual duty. So that might be a good place to start. Um, but I don't, I can't think offhand of like a specific table where it's housing and um, job uh, development working together, workforce development. It's an important, it's an important point. And here's another opportunity for us to listen carefully about something that perhaps needs to be coordinated in the, in the near future. Kristen, can you speak to the kind of layered approach that, that we rise is taking? Absolutely. Um, we recognize that no single grant changes community or changes the tra trajectory of the economic recovery. It requires that the that these investments be coordinated and be layered together. So in the places where we're making neighborhood anchor investments, which are our real estate community facility investments, we're going back and looking for opportunities to layer in support for the workforce uh, and 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 you know, good jobs and preparing people to get connected back to the workforce in those same communities. And we're going back in again and looking for opportunities for the existing businesses to grow or to nurture the small businesses that are there or to support small businesses as they try to get into space or, or to buy the space that they're renting. And so it's all those things together. Um, and we are, we are doing um, some working groups in, in three different communities to build out that conversation, but we're also looking for places that have existing tables where they're having those conversations about how these things intersect already to build off the work that folks are already doing. So I know there are some communities that have made the connection between housing and workforce, and there's some communities where maybe that table doesn't exist. Um, but I think it's a great point to, to keep asking, how do we knit these initiatives together? How do we um, bring together the variety of investments to make sure that they're all pulling in the same direction and building on one another? Thank you. Well, we've got about three minutes left. And so I'm going to take um, the prerogative to ask one final question of, of Dr. Garcia. Um, Dr. Garcia, you mentioned that there was hope 
in the community as you even began the conversations. And I would just wonder, of, as you went through the conversations, what struck you as giving you the greatest hope for the future and seeing the resilience of our uh, members of our communities? You said what struck me, sorry, you cut off there for a little bit, so it struck me as- yep. As the most hopeful. As the most hopeful. I think, um, honestly, what comes to mind is there was one participant who talked about seeing the humanity, really, um, the humanity throughout this pandemic. And that really stuck with me in terms of really the importance throughout these conversations that we heard about the importance of just, we're all human beings trying to get through this pandemic, right? And so we need to support each other, regardless if you're undocumented, regardless if of your color of your skin, right? Like we're all human beings in this together and we need to do what we can to support one another. And that really struck me is that, you know, as they talked about, losing family and friends, this fear of of getting infected, which all resonates with me, right? I have a, I have a three-year-old son who I'm constantly worried about him just getting sick. And, but I think that's what just the importance of, yes, you're like, it's just so important to keep in mind just the humanity and all this and um, that we just have to help each other out and continue to help one another out, whether that's, I know there were some uh, community members who talked about themselves cooking uh, for their neighbors in order to, to provide them with food and meals, right? And so little things like that, when you help you know, somebody, you would help everybody in your community. And so I think that's what that particular person and her, and, and, and she, um, uh, without a lot of prompting, that's she mentioned that. I think it was like an, um, an icebreaker at the beginning of the conversation. And that's something that she just naturally brought up. And I was like, wow, that's something really important, the positivity, right? And the possibilities that are out there, um, you know, amidst all this that's that was going on and that's still going on. But yeah, thanks, Gloria, for that question. Well, thanks to all of our um, speakers today. It's, you know, an important conversation. And to all of the participants, your, your insights, your knowledge of what can really help com communities thrive is what motivates all of us to continue to do our work. And we really thank each of you for, for your um, contribution to our work. Everyone, have a wonderful rest of your afternoon. I think that's it. <laughs>